Hey everyone, David Aragona here with the Valentine's Day edition of Horses to Watch, February 14th, as we take a look back at some races from the past week, trying to find some horses that had trouble in the races, were compromised by their trips, and ones that we can make note about for future starts, whether these are horses that we bet back the next time that they run, or looking for a race that they find themselves in appropriate spot and down the line, making these trip notes on these horses that we talk about will enrich our understanding of the form when these horses show back in the past performances. Well, I've got four races to take a look at this week. There are three from Aqueduct and one from Tampa Bay Downs. We'll get to the Tampa replay at the end of the show, but let's begin with those three Aqueduct replays. I've got one from each day of racing last week at Aqueduct, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll begin with the Friday, February 9th replay. It was race six on the card, a maiden special weight going seven furlongs on the dirt for the four-year-old and up runners. And we can break these horses from the gate. We're focusing on the number two, pricing power. And you can see this horse breaks about a half to three quarters of a length slowly from the gate. Not ideal for a runner that wants to be forwardly placed, but you could say he's immediately going to rush right up and take the early lead in this race, securing the front end. The pace of this race was on the honest side. The first quarter was color-coded red in time form US, indicating that it was a relatively fast opening quarter. And just from a race flow standpoint, you want to note that the eventual winner of this race is the horse all the way on the right of the screen, the number three hero's medal. He's going to make a big rush from last place all the way to the front end by the time they finish up this seven furlong affair. But the thing that I really want to highlight with regard to pricing power and also this card on February 9th is that the rail bias that we had been talking about for a few weeks at Aqueduct had dissipated by Friday and especially by this point in the day because it really felt like the track shifted considerably halfway through this Friday card where by the time we got to race six, which is this race, you did not want to be on the rail. If you watch the last three races on this card, races six, seven, and eight, horses that were on the inside were just spitting their wheels by the time they got into the stretch. And you'll notice this horse that we're highlighting, the number two, Pricing Power, he is right down on the rail for almost the entirety of his trip. And it did seem like both he and the horse right behind an excellent man, who was another contender in this race, were traveling well up until the midpoint of the turn. But you could see they come under pressure here. Excellent men goes backwards. Pricing Power drifts about a path off the rail right here, trying to fight back, but just racing in that deeper going down towards the inside, he could not finish off this race. Now, this was also the first start in about 15 months for pricing power. He was coming off a lengthy layoff into this race, so he had a right to need this start anyway. And he just seems like a five-year-old that must have been trading well in the interim because Shad Brown uh, deemed fit to run this horse in a maiden special weight as a five-year-old after all this time away and just the second start of his career, rather than immediately drop into a maiden claiming race. So there clearly were some expectations around pricing power, fulfilling the promise that he had shown as a younger horse. And I hope that the connections give him one more chance in maiden special weight next time, because I think he ran better than it might appear in this race. Because when you watch back the last three to four races on this Friday, February 9th card, it really seems like horses that were racing right on the rail had no chance. I mean, I mean horses that were losing by 15, 20 lengths, but it looked like they were contenders or even favorites coming into the race. So pricing power did the best of all those that raced on the rail towards the end of the day. And I think he's one that you do want to give an extra look to when he comes back for his next start. Let's move on to a race from Saturday, February 10th, the very next day at Aqueduct. Seemed like the bias has dissipated by Saturday, a pretty fair racetrack. We're going to take a look at race five from this Saturday card. It's a maiden special weight going six furlongs for the New York bred three-year-old Phillies. We can break these runners from the gate. We're going to focus on one of the first-time starters, the number eight stress reliever. And this was a race that looked just loaded with potentially talented first-time starters. Plenty of pedigrees in this race, horses that have reportedly been working well. And stress reliever was one of those. She was bet down to five to two in this race. And you can see she's trying to keep up on the backstretch. Manny Franco is niggling after her a little bit, but she's just not really able to hold her position in that first vanguard of horses. And she's going to drop back to be about second to last as they move past the half mile pole right here. And you can see at about this point, she starts to feel that kickback of that leading group and she comes under a ride and she's not responding. You would see she's kind of holding her head up high in the air right here, just not really reacting well to that kickback that's coming into her face and losing valuable position as they move around the far turn here. And 
you just you see this sometimes from inexperienced horses. They feel that kickback of a, a a wall of horses in front of them. They're not able to run through it the first time that they encounter it. But once Manny Franco really gets after this horse at the top of the stretch and he takes out the whip right here, gives her a smack of it, and she suddenly realizes, oh, it's time to run. And you can sort of see her chiclet at the bottom of the screen, the number eight horse. She's out of the picture right now, but she's going to start to maintain her stride and actually start passing horses as they come across the finish line here. And you'll notice her as they pass across the wire. She She's moving best of all across the finish line. We're going to pick her up on the gallop out. And she actually gallops out very well at the end of this race. There's the winner. And here comes stress reliever galloping out right past her at the finish of uh, about a furlong past the wire of this race. So she just feels like a horse to me that wasn't mentally clued in to what she encountered first time out. And she'll be much better for having this experience under her belt. Also, I think that she's a horse that could benefit from a stretch out in distance because while she is by practical joke, who can be known as more of a sprinter, mile or sire there's a lot of stamina on the bottom side of this pedigree and often horses like this that don't show that quickness out of the gate to keep up with the faster paces of sprint races but will stay on the way that she did at the end of a race those horses typically are, can be much more forward when they stretch out to races like the one turn miles that we see at aqueduct and be able to sustain that pace getting to that more comfortable rhythm being more forwardly placed so i would like to see stretch stress reliever stretch out in her next start because i think this filly for chad brown uh, has more ability than what she showed on debut. Let's move on to another New York bred maiden race. This one took place on Sunday's card, February 11th, and it was the final race of that day. Uh, this one, uh, a maiden special weight event uh, going the mile for New York bred three-year-old males. And we'll break these runners from the gate, and we're going to focus on two horses drawn right alongside each other. The number six, Land Doro, and the number seven, Charles J. Now, both of these horses finished pretty far back in the pack. Uh, there was an impressive winner of this race, uh, the number nine, St. Gaudens, who uh, actually Actually, we highlighted on Horses to Watch. If you've been watching recent episodes, St. Gaudens was badly compromised by a bias on debut, and he came back over a fair race track and was a dominant winner of this race, paying over $8. Uh, but you can go back and watch that episode from January if you like to review it. We're focusing on two different horses in this race, though. Uh, the number six, Land Doro. He was a first-time starter for Christophe Clement written by Madison Olver, and I think the rider assignment, a lower profile jock that Christoph doesn't use that much, probably an indicator this horse needed the start. Also in this race, Charles J, who we're highlighting, he is right outside of Landoro at this point. They're about third and fourth uh, towards the inside at this point. The problem is with their position is that they are following a 50 to one shot that is about to back up in their face. And you're going to notice that this run around the far turn here, this 50 to one shot just basically clogs up the inside two pads coming around the far turn and all of the horses that are moving towards the outside are just have this unobstructed path. They're going to go right past these horses that basically lost all the momentum because they're having to maneuver an angle outside of this horse that is basically coming to a stop. And the horses that lost the most momentum in that were the number six, Landoro, and the number seven, Charles J. Now, Charles J, he's going to go off the screen, finish far back. His rider, Eric Cancel, he just basically gives up at this point. But as for Landoro, you could see Natty Olver, she starts to ask this horse for a little bit more advantage stretch. He's actually going to finish off this race decently uh, coming through the lane. He's going to ultimately get up for fifth in this race, passing his stablemate who actually had more experience as they come onto the wire. Now, Nobody is in the same league as this winner, St. Gaudens, who seems like he might have uh, potentially New York Red Stakes potential down the line. But I did like the way the number six, uh, Landoro, finished off the race. Definitely seems like one that is a dirt router. Uh, pedigree suggests the same thing as Dan Landmine was a confirmed dirt router who wanted to go as far as nine furlongs. This one's by Medallia Doro uh, from the family of Bar of Gold, that Breeders' Cup Philly and Mary Sprint winner who could also go route distances. So I think this is a horse who has more ability than this first result would indicate. As for Charles J, this horse lost by upwards of 20 lengths. The performance is not nearly as bad as it seems. There is some question about whether he's really a dirt horse because he did make his debut on the turf and that was by far the best result he's achieved so far. Uh, but his two subsequent dirt efforts probably not as bad as they look, including this one. So he's one that he, maybe if he drops in class uh, in a next start on the dirt or just finds a soft or maiden special weight, he's a horse that you could project could achieve a better result on the dirt, but probably one that you want to look for down the line on the turf because his form is not nearly as bad as it looks. 
Let's move on to one more race to discuss on this episode of Horses to Watch. It is a race from Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday. That's Sam F. Davis undercard. And it's race nine, a maiden special weight event going a mile and a 16th on the turf for three-year-old fillies. And we're going to focus on the two horses that are breaking from the two outside starting gates in this nine-horse field. Let's break these runners from the gate. And the number eight, Gossiper, and the number nine, Oversubscribed, are the two that we are going to focus on for this replay, primarily the number nine oversubscribed. Gossiper, you'll notice, uh, she's a second time starter in this race, and she's just going to be a little bit keener through the early stages as Junior Alvarado tries to get her to settle towards the back of the pack. And the problem with Gossiper is that she is just going to be wide, three to four wide around the turns in a race that was just featuring no pace towards the front end. They are just going at a glacial clip in the early stages. You'll see the fractions come up. They're just extremely slow from a raw time standpoint. I looked up the time form U.S. pace figures for this race. I mean, they are in the low 40s, just as slow as a pace as you're going to see on the turf. And what makes it really difficult for a horse like Gossiper is that this field really sprints home through the stretch and is flying across the wire through the final 16th or eighth of a mile of this race. So a horse like Gossiper from the position that she was in really has no chance. Now, oversubscribed, she probably should have had no chance as well, except for the fact that oversubscribed seems like she is a stakes quality individual who is a lot better than the horse that she was facing in this race. Now, oversubscribed is going to finish this race in a dead heat for the victory, and it's almost m miraculous that she was able even to get her nose on the wire uh, in a tie for first, just given her positioning throughout this race, because she's never in a great spot. She was three wide around the first turn. You could see she's locked in and behind horses here. There's a runner outside of her who's making an early move trying to get in position for this sprint to the finish that you know is coming in the straight because they've gone so slowly up until this point and you can see gosper highlighted there she's out of position doesn't do much in the stretch but oversubscribed she's in behind horses angling inside typically for inexperienced young horses angling back towards the in inside is the last thing that you want to do because they've got to get brave to rally between horses but there goes oversubscribed slicing between horses at the 16th pole there to just get up in that tie for the finish at a uh, tie for the first place at the finish of this race with a horse who was on the lead for almost the entire race so between those two horses, the dead, feet, dead heated for the victory, oversubscribed was far and away the better of the two. And if you're looking at the time form U.S. speed figures for this race, oversubscribed actually gets a number that's higher than the winner than the, the other co-winner of this race because oversubscribed is getting a much bigger pace upgrade for closing into that slow pace. She actually got a 91 time form U.S. speed figure for this race. That's higher than the buyer number, which uh, is difficult because the buyers are final time speed figures and they're always going going to be held down in really bunched up finishes like that. You can't give a big upgrade for horses that just closed into a slow pace because you'd have to upgrade the entire field. And that's not really fair to do for the horses that got better trips than oversubscribed did. But this filly, regardless of what the speed figure comes back, based on that visual, you can tell this is a horse with real talent. She was a near $500,000 purchase at the Tattersall sale by Clara Fitzstables and Chad Brown, daughter of the European sire, too darn hot, and just feels like a horse that has a lot more ability than whatever speed figure is assigned to this debut victory. And just she's one that I think we would look for in stakes company next time out. I also wanted to highlight Gosper, who finished much further back in the pack, because she's a daughter of English Channel, who just strikes me as one that is going to be better for these experiences that she's getting. And she really had no chance given her attributes to be successful in this race. But being that daughter of English Channel and watching the way she runs, I think she's a young three-year-old that's ultimately going to be best going some longer distances, maybe even some marathon distances down the line. And I think she's better than her first couple of results might indicate. So just wanted to keep in mind, maybe even if not for the next start, a little bit later when the di distances start to stretch out, for these three-year-olds. So those are all the horses to watch and take a look at from this past week. If you want to follow these horses moving forward, you can add them to your horse watch under your DRF.com account. That way you'll get email notifications when these horses run back in the future. Another great thing to do is to take advantage of the notes function in DRF Formulator and time for USPPs. You can make notes on track biases or card notes, trip notes on individual horses. And those notes that you make will show up in the running lines of the past performances when these horses are entered back in the future. So that's all the horses to watch for this week. Remember to listen to horses to watch next week. We've got another batch of replays to take a look at on February 21st.